Hello and welcome to today's webinar. It's on minimizing IoT project risks with future-proof IoT device management. My name is Jeremy Cowan, and I'm co-founder of IoT Now, and it's my real pleasure to be your moderator today. Thank you so much for joining us around the world. I'm delighted to say that this webinar is brought to you with our partners, AV System. Today, we're going to be learning how to start your IoT device management project off on the right foot. AV System will cover the fundamentals of IoT device management, and we'll also dive deeper into common industry challenges regarding security and interoperability. So let me introduce you to our speakers. In order of appearance, they are Will Yan, President, Americas at AV System. A really warm welcome to you, Will. Thank you, Jeremy. And Marcin Nodge, Product Director for IoT at AV System. Very good to have you here, Marcin. Thank you, Jeremy. Very good also from my side to be here. Thank you both. Now, please don't forget, as usual, this webinar is being recorded. And from tomorrow, you can access the audio and slides at iot-now.com and also from AV Systems website. So later on, we'll be asking you for your thoughts. We'll have three quick polls and we'll all see the results immediately. And finally, after the presentations, I'll be putting your questions to our panel. I'm delighted to say we've already had some great questions in from the audience when they registered. So thank you, all of you. Please keep your questions coming. Start sending me your questions right now. Type them into the window on your screen, and we will discuss as many as we can in the time. Any that we don't get to, we will pass to AB System to come back to you later. And if you're having any technical issues with audio or slides, you can also use the question window and get help from our tech support team. Now, without further ado, let me hand over to Will. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good day. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It's our pleasure to share with you our experiences. And if you, uh, if we can simplify IoT into three layers, you got the, like just like the word IoT, the T is the things. Things are the devices, sensors, actuators, controllers. So that's the device layer. Then you got the I, which is internet, which is interconnection, which is connectivity. So that's your uh, either cellular IoT connectivity or your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, your IoT connectivity. Stuck in the middle, the O, let's use that letter for one thing, standing for integration and application enablement. Today's topic, as uh, Jeremy introduced, is focusing on the first, the bottom layer, which is device, device management, issues related to device, device management to support your IoT services. Hello, thank you for joining us again. And uh, so a, a few quick words about AV System. We are a software technology innovator. We provide specifically a IoT device management and data management platform. Our uh, customers or partners are in the service provider space, global telecom operators, broadband service providers, fixed and mobile. Our customers also enterprises directly that can be in any of the industrial uh, verticals, aerospace, transportation, asset tracking, fleet management, and uh, weather stations, and uh, automotive uh, industry what have you. A third component of uh, customers, partners working with us is what we call OEMs. These are the key players in the IoT ecosystem. They provide the chipset, the modules, the sensors, the devices, and uh, that enables uh, the fundamentals of IoT services. Uh, we are vendor neutral meaning we work with all uh, manufacturers. We're access technology agnostic, 
meaning we work on, uh, I just mentioned, uh, cellular IoT network like MB IoT, LTM, even satellite-based IoT networks. We are protocol agnostic, if you will, or multi-protocol support. Uh, we're going to get into more of the details of that in a second. So let's quickly review, uh, do a level set. What is IoT? What are we talking about? Why we're single out device management today as a key topic? So IoT is all about digital transformation. That is the business imperative. That's what we are going after for. Digitize our business for efficiency, productivity, and uh, operational uh, longevity. It's about getting smart. We're connecting the uh, dispersed assets, getting the data to clean insight to add, to aid our decision making. Smart networks, smart device, smart machines, smart data, smart computing. At the end of the day, is to enable smart business. It's about connecting all of these things. It's also about remote control, remote management, which is really very relevant today because of the pandemic, right? So it put more urgency on the IoT projects. In our recent uh, audience poll uh, we conducted a couple of weeks ago, 50% of the audiences responded that their IoT project got put on steroid, accelerated growth, priority, higher attention from executives of the company because the urgency to connect things to remotely manage because of lack of a physical access or restriction of physical access, at least temporarily, before we are able to put this uh, pandemic away. It's about automation automating decisions and uh, perform autonomous computing. So what are the challenges now, you may ask? So security is a big one. The security of the devices, who can access, who cannot. The security of the data, who can access, who cannot. The security of the network. And uh, how do we prevent denial of service attacks? Security is number one concern as uh, uh, all of us know. Also, we're dealing with disjointed systems, disparate uh, platforms, data from different places. Why do we need all of these data besides what we collect from the sensors? Because we want to put context to what's going on on the device level to make smart decisions. We're dealing with torrents of the data. It's going to be, you know, now we're talking about thousands of devices actually need to be scaling up to millions of them, tracking your business, tracking the deployed assets. So scalability is a big issue, comes with it as a risk. How do you scale up? How do you design an IoT device management platform that can handle millions of devices for the future so they are not obsolete next year? So you need standards. Martin. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Thanks for this introduction into the topic. Let's now go a little bit deeper into this security concern. And as, as Will just said, it's probably the biggest source of concern at the moment. The leading security experts in the field say that current security awareness in IoT deployment is worse than it was in the 90s for the personal computer. Mikko Hipponen, the chief research officer for F-Secure, in one of his speeches called Internet of Insecure Things last year, compared current IoT devices into IT asbestos of the future. He said, I'm quoting him, cheap, easy to manufacture, perfect in every way. You can mold it into any shape you want it. It's great for installation. It's great for fireproofing, but it's also little. The consequences of attacks on things can be far more severe than cyber attacks that we know from the past, because IoT enables, to, uh, affect, enables us to affect the actual physical world. Previously, it was possible to make attacks against data or information. Now, it will be possible to make attacks against flesh, steel, or concrete. Uh, Stuxnet, the famous malicious computer worm 
that uh, made headlines 10 years ago shows the scale of damages that an attack can make to an industrial infrastructure. One can imagine attacks against critical safety equipment, like smart smoke detectors, and impact it could have on human lives. Fortunately, in the last two years, we observed a raising awareness of the problem among important stakeholders. In 2018, FBI issued an announcement about making use of IoT devices for committing crime. And this year, we have also seen some work done by government on specifying legal regulations that are required to be provided for IoT devices. What are the greatest sins in IoT security? The, the first one is no security by design principle. This stands in the stark contrast to development of mobile phones. Somehow we don't learn from our past mistakes. Personal computers were not developed with security features in mind because very few understood the importance of security at that time. Mobile devices, on the contrary, for them, the security de design was the DNA of mobile security system design. This does not stand uh, for IoT devices. IoT devices very often suffer from poor buggy implementation of security features, like insecure credentials handling, usage of weak passwords, lack of proper communication protection, improper handling of personal and sensitive data. The second serious mistake comes from not thinking through how device should be operated in the field. Consequently, this leads to poor firmware or software update mechanism, very often ending up in using an old and unpatched operating system for the solutions in the field. Will? Yes. So we talk about the uh, security, the importance of a security, security. We talk about the data, torrent of the data. So uh, what the, the goal is connecting all these devices to collect the data and get insight, make decisions. This needs to be processed. And you need a platform to be able to handle that amount of data. You need a, a platform be able to uh, merge the contextual uh, data with uh, what you collect from the sensors and actuators. Uh, you need to uh, consider the limitation of the cloud and where you want to do the computation or send it over to the cloud or compute at the network edge. So we also talk about the challenge of uh, disjointed systems, dispersed data. It's the same idea. And uh, each use case is different from what you collect, how you process, what to report, and what to act on. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of uh, approach. It really depends on your use case. For example, in the manufacturing shop floor, your sensors attached to the machinery is different from a, a transportation company tracking an intermodal transportation piece of a container goods on the ship, in the truck, on the highway, in the warehouse, so on and so forth. So it's all about how to make relevant systems work to yield relevant data uh, insight. To that point, you know, of the few uh, risks in IoT device management, and uh, here comes our first question. We want to ask you uh, how your company is dealing with this. Jeremy. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the first poll then. Uh, and the first poll is this. It's asking, um, what's at risk with your organization's IoT project or digital journey, digital transformation journey? Is it the lack of executive leadership and sponsorship? Is it a lack of relevant, up-to-date IoT technology? Is it the lack of technology standards? Is it having a hard time justifying the business case or the return on investment or savings or new revenue streams? Or is it something else? So quickly, what's at risk with your organization's IoT project or digital transformation journey? A lack of executive leadership, lack of relevant up-to-date IoT technology skills, 
lack of technology standards, or having a hard time justifying the business case, or something else. And we can see the results coming through here. Uh, the preponderance there, the 48% uh, is about where it's settling around having a hard time justifying the business case. Anyway. Um, but very interesting, much... Jeremy. It's like, it sounds like nobody want to point a finger at their boss. Zero <laughs> percent. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's going to say that. Or are they? Uh, this is anonymous, so they can say what they like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. It's uh, critically important for us to point out. It's uh, confidential. Your yeah, response totally is confidential. only reported. We, we can't see who's replied in what way. So uh, you can always say what you, what you like with IoT now. Anyway, um, thank you, Will. Back to Marcin. In, in, in IoT, we we observe you know uh, a, con uh, a multitude of available device communication protocols, and uh, the two most popular ones are MQTT and the lightweight machine-to-machine -machine standards that we at AV System are are strongly advocating for. But we should also mention about other existing solutions. We see HTTP being used by some vendors. We see a close cousin of MQTT called AMQP. There's also this, these two protocols uh, work based on the public subscribe, public subscribe communication par paradigm. We see also a very popular protocol called XMPP that is very widely used in the real-time communication system. We are also seeing the older brother of lightweight OMADM in almost 20 years in the field and also co-op which is a optimized version of HTTP protocol that can be used for uh, for the constrained network and resource constrained device what is what is uh, a unique feature about lightweight machine to machine is that it is offering a well-defined well -defined data model that I'm going to explain and right now. So let's, let's take a deeper look at lightweight machine-to-machine. -machine. The, the important thing is that it has been created with the purpose of operating on constrained devices and in challenged networks. It recommends using UDP as a transport protocol as it doesn't require a connection handshake over head, which can be problematic in challenge environments. Since not all networks forward UDP traffic, there's also support for TCP. There's also support for transport over SMSs and non-IP uh, networks. Co-op, uh, the, the other protocol that, that I mentioned in the previous slide is the default application layer protocol and payload of co-op is filled with lightweight specific content. Since version 1.2 of lightweight machine to machine, there will be additional support for MQTT and HTTP in addition to CoA. So here it is very important for us to understand this difference between protocols that we that we described on the on the previous slide: MQTT, HTTP, CoA, and lightweight machine to machine. Very often, very often, people try to compare lightweight machine to machine with MQTT. And this is not a fair comparison because uh, lightweight machine is going one level up. It defines the model of the data that is going to be, to be sent to the devices, which makes it challenging to work in the beginning. But it also provides lots of ready-made functionality that can be used later for you. On the other hand, with protocols like MQTT, CoAP, or HTTP, it's, it's your job to still develop the, the format of the application messages. So you, might, you may uh, shorten or sh short circuit a little bit of your time in the beginning by providing some, your own custom format of, of the application protocol. But however, in the long run, you may end up in problems related to interoperability or of the things that you did not think through, whereas this, the similar problems have been, have been already encountered by the by the designers of lightweight machine-to-machine -machine protocol. So coming back to the more details about lightweight, there are four interfaces defined for bootstrapping of device, for registration, management of devices and service enablement, and finally for the information report. 
These interfaces define all operations needed to provide the whole device lifecycle management functionality, all through information and through information reporting interface. It also provides data monitoring capability. As I already mentioned, this crucial feature of lightweight machine-to-machine -machine is the well-defined data model that describes device state as a set of objects and resources that can be read, written, or executed depending on their nature. There are various payload formats available, TLV, CNML with JSON or CBOR, there's OPAC, there's plain text, and these uh, various payload formats uh, can be used according to particular device operation requirements. Finally, uh, security, security of communication is provided by DTLS protocol, which requires successful authentication of both client and server for successful communication. This is a very important aspect that it, it uh, forces, forces the server to actually check the identity of the, of the device. And what we see recently is that popularity of the lightweight machine to machine is growing in recent years, and all of the big players among the chipset vendors start to provide support for it. All right. So um, thank you for the detail, Martin. That's really detailed explanation. Uh, what is lightweight M2M? -M -M, and uh, also a little bit of a comparison with uh, what's going on in the marketplace. So as Martin mentioned, uh, Lightweight M2M -M is a device management protocol of technology uh, initiated by uh, Open Mobile Alliance, OMAR Specworks. So uh, you got a major uh, support from enterprises, uh, telecom carriers, and uh, lots of OEMs in the IoT ecosystem. So how it's being applied is on the device level, the chipset supports the protocol, the device, the modules, the um, sensors themselves, being able to send, communicate via this uh, technology standard. So you can pull data, control it, monitor, diagnose, and report. So there's a wide support of uh, OMAR, uh, lightweight M2M -M technology, a wide support of a IoT ecosystem. And um, I'm gonna go into the next slide. So uh, we've been talking about uh, device management and device management risks, security, scalability, and uh, future proof. What is, is device management fundamentals? What are the things a device management platform is expected to do? Number one, we need to onboard the device, right? We need to authenticate a device and we provision the device perform remote control, remote configuration of the device itself. And um, we do monitoring, uh, continue, continuous monitoring uh, diagnostics. We'll we perform uh, firmware updates, security patches. In security is such an important topic in this IoT services. We do troubleshooting. These are table stakes in the basic device and management platform. So Martin uh, uh, will take us through some of the life cycle uh, issues in terms of device management. Yes, Let, let's now have a, have a quick look at the device life cycle management, also from the, from the responsibility party point of view. We, there, are, there are four main phases of the life cycle. In the pre-commissioning phase, the OEM, builds and configures the device for the, for the initial deployment. And this is the sole responsibility of the OEM to do it properly. After that, the device is commissioned to operation and the responsibility for, for this device is transferred to the operation team. Then the next phase is, is the management, which constitutes the, the core part of the device management. Once the device is no longer needed, again, the operation team executes the commissioning. So we see that there are Two, uh, two stakeholders in this whole device lifecycle management. OEMs in the initial part, and after this, the responsibility is transferred to the operations. I'd like to illustrate the process that each OEM takes in order to build a device and keep adding new functionality for it. 
This is an example of how device management can be used for it. When you, when you start thinking about building, building a new device, you, you start with doing feasibility study, that you want to understand what are the requ functional requirements, what are, your, what are your constraints, and you ended up by selecting a hardware and starting to develop software that you are going to, to put onto your device. After you are reasonably happy, you start this, uh, the whole never-ending cycle of testing device functionality, checking its interoperability, then you provide some default credentials for the so-called factory credentials, and the device is ready to deploy. But once the device is ready to deploy, there are is always upcoming things. There is a request to provide new functionality. Uh, there is a bug that was discovered. There has been discovered a vulnerability. So this all requires OEM to take proper actions. Some of these are corrective actions, sometimes are development actions. They work on the new functionality, work on the right new code, and then there is a question, how do you, how do you test this code? So you come back in this loop to this, the same process. You give test functionality, interoperability, Maybe you don't provide the factory credentials. Again, this might be an omitted step, but then you are ready to update the device to put it in the field. We call it continuous testing process and conformance testing. And this is one of the, one of the device management applications. Similarly, we can formulate a similar process that is happening for the operation. Once the device is provisioned and configured to be deployed, by the operation team starts to collect telemetry and device data. They look at this data and then they see there are some things that are not working as expected. So they go into this diagnose phase and they fix problem. And then again, after the problem is fixed, they will need to redeploy the device again by providing some software. So we, hear, we are here in the process of continuous monitoring and continuous improvement, never ending process. And now, there is time for the second polling question, so I give my control to Jeremy. Thank you very much, Martin. Let's have a look at the second poll question. What's your organization's most pressing IoT device management challenge? Is it selecting a device management platform? Is it finding an in-house development, uh, developing an in-house device management platform? Is it making the current device management platform work effectively is it that we can't be bothered by it and ex expect device manufacturers to provide it with their devices or something else so which of these is your most pressing iot device management challenge selecting a device management platform developing an in-house platform making the current device management platform work more effectively or expecting a device manufacturer to provide it or something else and uh will there seems to be a neck and neck for the first and the third that selecting a device management platform or making the existing device management platform work effectively is there anything you want to add to this very interesting uh, uh response here and uh it shows that you came to the right place Either you answered one or the third. So this is the right webinar for you. And uh, either you're in the process of selecting a platform or you want to make your existing one work better. So that's what we're talking about here. So we can come uh, go offline after this webinar, get a further conversation with you based on our experience. Excellent. Thank you, Will. And back to Machine. Thank you. Thank you for this poll. Uh, now let's get back to security. We talked a lot about it, and let's briefly discuss the, the good practices. Uh, the, the first thing is that communication between a device and application server must be over secure channel. Uh, we, we mentioned that credentials management is a very often encountered problem. This means that credentials must be properly secured on the device. For this, we recommend storing them using some trust store or even better in a hardware security model if this is available on the device. We also recommend using device certificates for device provisioning, and these certif certificates can be provided by, by the public key infrastructure system. In such a use case, the preferred option is to generate a public-private key pair on a device 
and send the public key via the IoT application server to PKI that is supposed to generate certificate out of it. This way, the private key never leaves the device and remains stored securely. The second uh, important problem that, that we touched here was about scalability. We have to assume that there are going to be millions of devices connected. And at some point, communication with the cloud will become a bottleneck. So the, the way to go, as, as we already mentioned earlier, is, is deployment of edge platforms. And according to Google, more than 90% of data generated by devices provides very little information and can be handled by a simple logic that can be deployed at edge. In such an architecture, edge plays the role of platform as a service where arbitrary logic is executed and it is managed, managed from the cloud application. The logic of edge applications support device operation. It may involve data filtering, data aggregation, also time critical decisions where there is not enough time budget to send data for decision to the, to the cloud, but, but the edge device will provide an answer to this, and also artificial intelligence model. Now again, time for the final polling questions. Back to Jeremy. Thanks very uh, much. I think we have, uh, we have the final poll question here, and it is this. What IoT device management or IoT data transfer technology or protocol is most relevant to your organization's IoT initiative? Is it MQTT? Lightweight N2M, TR69 stroke 369, AMQP, or something else, or you're not sure. Is it MQTT, LWMT M2M, TR69 stroke 369, or is it AMQP, or something else, or you're not quite sure. And uh, that is quite evenly split. Will uh, there seems to be a, a slight lead for lightweight M to M. Is that what you were expecting? Uh, kind of, yeah. It, it's no, no surprises there. And um, what we are seeing is uh, across the board, uh, various uh, technologies being adopted, used uh, in place today. And we are seeing very encouraged to see the lightweight M to M by Omar Specworks. It is designed for managing constrained devices over constrained networks. Examples of that is a sensor, low battery power, low uh, memory, and a low flash, all of that, and uh, millions of them out there, and uh, are going to transmit over a uh, narrow band IoT. It needs to be lightweight. So we see the uh, emergence, uh, uh, influential position that lightweight M2M is uh, shaping up to be. MQTT has been around for a long time, as uh, Martin uh, is uh, explaining to us. And uh, TR69 and TR369, TR69 is also OMAR's uh, standard. Traditionally, it's widely deployed uh, in the past. It's more of a legacy. And um, so I'm not surprised there are still some people are not quite familiar with a specific technology. You could be the business owner which is an IoT service at the end of the day, is not about technology, right, Jeremy and Martin? It's not about technology. It's about a business case. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you came to the right place if you are uh, not familiar with these technologies. Uh, because at the end of the day, is really driving to a direction to uh, make sure to service your application needs, your use case needs. So I'm not surprised at all, but I'm also encouraged uh, uh, a fair amount, 33%, a third of the audience answered the question, uh, is somewhat at least uh, familiar with uh, Live with M2M. And um, uh, I'm very encouraged, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure Omar Speckworks will be very happy to hear that as well. Likewise. Well, look, uh, that's a really fascinating response uh, from the audience, and thank you for your thoughts on that, Will. I'm going to close the poll now and go back to you, Will. Oh, 
I think uh, so, uh, now we're talking about uh, a few folks uh, uh, already uh, started uh, uh, asking questions. I'm, I'm glad that you're engaged with us. Very good. So the key question, and uh, I'm sharing this quick uh, glance of the questions is, where do I start? How do I start? I know lightweight and m I know you guys are pretty good with this stuff, lightweight and m And how do I start? If my device is not ready to support lightweight and m what do I do? So help is on the way. Omar Spikeworks, if you go to GitHub uh, website, they got open source tools available. One of these tools is called Anjay SDK. It happens to be from us, <laughs> no secret, from AV system. We provide a open source tool to enable you to get your device ready, be able to communicate northbound to the uh, server management platform. So you can use that on Uh and there are other choices too. Uh, we happen to be uh, to know that uh, major uh, enterprises and telecom operators are already adopting on to uh, to do the work. So there are two flavors we can do. Martin can get into more detail, but I'm going to highlight two things. If you choose, you have the development capability. Your company can just use the uh, the SDK to write your code through the firmware and your device are ready to go. Or you don't, you have a limited resources, limited uh, 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 knowledge. You can hire a company for support like us from us to uh, build the firmware, uh, develop the firmware for you and support it. And uh, the goal is the same. How do we quickly, how do we quickly deploy the devices to support IoT services? on a massive scale. That goal, either of this mode, support the same goal. Martin, uh, anything uh, you want to elaborate a little further on, Andre? Right, so one one of the common, common things that we kept hearing in, the recent, hearing in the recent months was that, you know, there is not much of lightweight machine-to-machine -machine ecosystem. It's just difficult to start with. So in, in the last couple of months, we have dedicated quite a significant amount of time to providing more of tooling for quick and rapid development of, of lightweight machine-to-machine -machine, uh, applications. We provided a network shell for rapid client testing, which allows you to just verify as if you were like connecting the server if the device is responding properly to, to your commands. We have also launched try Andre platform where you can just, you know, have a open and free access to, to our server for, for uh, trying to execute operations remotely using lightweight machine-to-machine -machine protocol. And finally, we have started publishing ready-made integrations for the popular development boards. We have, uh, cover, we have covered STM32 boards. We start now working for the providing, uh, providing ready-made integrations for, for the Nordic semiconductor boards, and then we will keep on Keep on adding more of these developer boards, always in the with the spirit of you know reducing time to market, helping you bootstrap your lightweight machine to machine uh, application. One very interesting thing that we have developed and published recently was uh, this rapid prototyping application for uh, and based on Android that you can execute on your on your Linux machine as if you were as if you were writing a simple Python client. We are highly encouraging you to to go to our GitHub page and download it. You can you can basically build your lightweight machine to ma machine application in a couple of minutes just using it. Then on the server side, we um, mentioned a lot about testing and interoperability. And one of the key features that we are offering is the testing framework with a set of predefined, predefined tests, testing conformance of your device with the lightweight machine-to-machine -machine protocol, testing if service is behaving, as it's, if the service on your device is behaving as it is supposed to behave, so performance testing, testing of your stability, of security features, and connectivity. And on the on the second aspect of the responsibility, we talked about a tool for, for the operations. Our Coyote platform provides functionality for executing remote configuration operations, pod management, monitoring, FOTA, and it also provides an easy way to attach 
application enablement platform so that you can manage your devices from the from the third party systems and execute execute proper proper operations based based on your based on your business needs in in your in your application that's really good that's really good detail so if i go back to uh this slide uh, what Martin mentioned in terms of the predefined tests. In our experience deploying uh, uh, IoT services around the world with major enterprises or telecom carriers, we see a step one really important is interop testing for device onboarding, isn't it, Martin? So we see this uh, all the time. So people are asking us for automated platform to automate these tests at the protocol level, at the service level, performance, scalability, and all of these. So uh, there are companies, you know, enterprises or carriers, they have a multiple different kind of tools. The problem occurs when they start doing intra because you're gonna end up with more than one brand of sensors, right? You're gonna end up with uh, supporting the sensors has multiple, not just one uh, chipset uh, unit uh, either. So uh, different modules, all of that stuff. So you need an automated platform. And uh, Coyote uh, as happens to be the tool, or Andre happens to be the tool that can help you to do that. And uh, so that's a step number one, get device onboarding. Uh, we see that a major challenge before we even get take off for scalability. Right, Martin? Yes, definitely. I think we are, we are also you now observing this quite positive feedback from our customers that started using it and saying, you know, that this massively reduces their time to market for for providing devices just just for the initial deployment. Right. So we talked about today and uh, the digital transformation. What is IoT? What is the device management in IoT? What are the risks associated with it? What are the popular technologies going to be uh, able to be employed uh, to support all of these? And Martin took us really down very deep level technically, explaining the protocol, explaining the functionality, including some screenshots. I think Jeremy, at this point, we are about another 15 minutes uh, left in the webinar, and let's open the floor up for for audience questions. I think that's that's a great idea, Will. We've got so many questions and some really good ones. Let's go to the first that I would like to put to you. Um, this is from uh, Omar Monrai, who says, we need to integrate wireless sensors act or actuators to our current hardware platform, comprised of Modbus-capable power meters and heating, ventilation, air conditioning controllers. How can this be done? Um, from this aspect, could I come to you, Machin? Right. So, uh, th thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Modbus is is an industrial uh, type of protocol that's very fairly popularly used uh, within within uh, industrial devices and so on, like power meters. Uh, it is not lightweight machine to machine, so there is a need for. Uh, if, if if you if if Omar you are you are interested in in integrating uh, your your solution with lightweight machine to machine, then there is a need for for translation of uh, Modbus messages into into uh, lightweight to machine lightweight machine to machine messages. So this can be this can be achieved by uh, using a gateway that is going to become standard for the 1.2 version of lightweight to machine to machine. The next question, thank you, Marcin. The next question that I'd like to put out there is uh, more of a market one. So maybe one for you, Will. Um, how do you see the evolution from SIM-based connectivity end-to-end uh, -to -end towards IoT, that is device and data management for mobile network operators over the next five years? You know, I think uh, the cellular-based IoT network uh, is gonna play a major role in uh, in IoT services, and there's no doubt. Uh, parallel to, you know, that's why you're seeing uh, the adoption, uh, the take rate, take up rate for uh, NB IoT. Uh, it, it, it's more of a guaranteed quality of a service 
uh, uh, so to speak, uh, than the uh, non-regulated uh, uh, band. So, uh, but in parallel, you also see this, uh, we hear a lot more nowadays about this uh, 5G, right? And 5G and the private uh, IoT uh, networks. So enterprise is gonna go out there to purchase bandwidth on their own and their spectrums and uh, launch their own uh, private IoT networks. But uh, I still see uh, really good prospects for uh, mobile uh, operators uh, to be very relevant in this IoT services, especially for managing the service, right? Um, across the globe, not only limited to one territory, the mobile operators, the CM uh, has global roaming capability or roaming partnerships, uh, they're uh, stitching together and uh, give you that uh, scale. Uh, I, I think from my perspective, that's going to be a, a very important for multinational uh, operations. For example, in one of our uh, deployment supporting a um, transportation company, and the company is a European company, uh, a container ship left uh, in uh, Rotterdam, <laughs> going to, to the Mediterranean and go to the Pacific, and uh, all the way come to North America. So all of these process is global in nature. And that's what IoT is also a key aspect of it, is a global nature of uh, operation, being able to track and trace, uh, to collect telemetry data, execute decision, no matter where it is in the, in the process. Fair enough. Um, can I stay with you for this one, Will? Uh, Machin may want to comment as well. The questioner asks, can we use Coyote over either LoRaWAN wireless M bus, or is it uh, dedicated to GSMA3 GPP protocols? Oh, very good question, Victor. And uh, absolutely, and uh, Coyote is a lightweight M2M uh, protocol based. It supports uh, LoRaWAN, uh, definitely it, it does support. Uh, maybe, uh, Martin, if you are open to explain a little further uh, the technical details, but you know we've uh, we've uh, we have the you know at the moment is a lot of our uh, deployment is on the MBIOT side and Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth uh, low energy networks of, of course, but uh, we have a couple of uh, early stage in the lower one space. Martin, right. did you want to add anything on that? Uh, well, well, basically, you know, Coyote is uh, uh, in the most most basic solution. That the Coyote is the you know IP access platform. So whatever you can you can connect to to the IP network, uh, you can you can use Coyote with it. Uh, we are also we are also providing some uh, gateways for non-IP data access as well. So. Uh, we are not limited just to just IP networks. However, this is not not the not the basic functionality of the platform. And uh, f finally, I also wanted you know to mention about this uh, non-IP environment is that there are also existing technology solutions for this that you can use, you you can also run IP over the non-IP layer. For example, you can run IP over Bluetooth, and then you, this way you can you can easily run lightweight machine to machine. Using the using the Bluetooth networks. Thank you, Mushi. Um, still seven or eight minutes left, and we have uh, good questions coming in all the time. Uh, this one is: Do you think LoRaWAN or NB-IoT are a solution for the large-scale IoT devices? If you do, what are the challenges? Will, what's your view on that? Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, <clears throat> at least for large scale. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, the primary uh, the goal is supporting uh, large scale uh, IoT services. You know, not a huge number of devices. Uh, I think where the question comes from is this: the reality today, most of IoT projects are still in the uh, early stage, in the uh, POC mode, and uh, if you will, so. Um, People hasn't really uh, haven't really started uh, uh, thought out the, the the future when uh, millions of sensors can be connected. 
Um, so I think it's still the issue is still the uh, which network to choose really depends on. It's not because the technology one is better over the other. Uh, I think I said this before. It's our experience tells us it's more driven by use case and uh, what is uh, driving. Uh, for example, when we are doing things in Brazil, um, agricultural IoT is a huge. Uh, space, getting a lot of attention, a lot of investments, tracking the crop field, you know, temperature, pressure, uh, pressure uh, moisture level, uh, insect activities. That use case is very different from uh, the example I mentioned, the uh, transportation, you know, going through seven seas of the world, if you will. So I think it's more of a, a use case driven uh, over technology in here. Thank you, Will. Um, here's kind of a market question with a technical aspect. Um, Will, I'll come to you with this one first, if I may. Uh, this was kind of brushed over, um, touched on in our polls. How many device vendors already use lightweight M2M? And is lightweight M2M taking up fast? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Very good question. So uh, there, I'll answer this as three things. I'll give you the data, right? The best place you can go may not be very current because there are more vendors coming into the space working with Omar Specworks. But if you Google Omar Specworks lightweight M2M, they do give a list of uh, uh, some of the vendors uh, who are participating and uh, are supporting it and uh, part of that ecosystem. That's one number you can go. Uh, second number I give you is uh, our proprietary data, you know, who we are working with. We're working with uh, no less than 40, no less than 40, that's conservatively, based on what I'm aware. And uh, the vendors, the chipset vendors, the, uh, the module providers, and uh, uh, you know, no, no less than 40, we're doing testing work, interop uh, work uh, that we're working with, and that's 40. And uh, every day there's a new one, every day there's a new one. And uh, we got a lot of inquiries uh, it's not a, a kind of a bragging, but uh, we invested early, or uh, like with M2M, uh, about around for seven years. We're one of the companies invested early. We voted ourselves to the top uh, for device, uh, like with M, M2M based device management in IoT. And therefore, whenever people Google like with M2M, they come to us. They uh, at least pick our brains, so which is good. Uh, we don't mind to share our experience. Um, so we every day we got a new uh, uh, device manufacturer asking us um, how, how to support a library program, uh, what tools are available, and what are the issues that they need to be aware, of, what resource are their developers skill, embedded engineers, and, <laughs> and we got an inquiries like that. So uh, I, I missed the second part of that question. So uh, how many was the first one? Uh, so what was the second part? Do you, can you roll back or? Uh, I can't go back on that, but um, it was really just yeah. to understand how how widespread it is. Yeah, so uh, we we are seeing after seven years, it, it is still emerging, but this is more of a plug for uh, Omar Specworks. That uh, uh, Machi mentioned uh, current release a couple weeks ago is 1.2, and then on the roadmap going forward, they want to make this uh, more enterprise friendly, more uh, more cloud friendly. And there may be a hidden question somewhere. Somebody's going to ask, why is uh, you know the major guys, Google, the Azure guys, uh, not coming out strong? But they are in the in the ecosystem picture. If you go to Omar Specworks, and uh, at the moment, specialty shops like AV System, we are leading the market. Fair okay, enough. we got a new one. Well, there's another uh, question. Not unrelated, um, somebody who would like to ask about this, is uh, L L uh, Lightweight M2M restricted to IP networks? Uh, clearly, they want to pick your brains as well. I thought the data models asked the questioner are an encoding standard, not a transport print protocol. Uh, Marcin, would you want to comment on that? Uh, sure. So first, first. Uh, answer to this is that lightweight M2M is not restricted just by IP network. There are these bindings for non-IP data delivery as well. 
the, regarding the second question, uh, the data models uh, is, uh, is, is a big advantage of, of, of lightweight machine to machine. It just let, it lets, uh, lets you, lets, lets the user model the, the, the state of the data in a well organized, well formed manner that is, uh, you know, also accepted by the, by the community. This means that uh, it's not only you that thought about it, but there are also other eyes looking at it and providing feedback. Did you think about this uh, corner case? Did you think about other corner case? And uh, this data model can be encoded in multiple formats based on the particular requirements of the network. It can be encoded as a TLV, which is type length value type of format. It can be encoded as JSON or as CBOR or whatever other format. Uh, I think what, what is important here to understand is that encoding is just about you know how do you how do you how do you put the the bits on the wire or send them in the air, but the the actual value is is in this abstract concept of the data model which which tries to visualize and describe state of the device and this is above the above the encoding standard. There are multiple encoding standards so that you can choose whatever is, is the most optimal for your particular solution. Fair enough. Marcin, thank you. There's time just for one more question. I'm going to bring this to you, Will. Um, how do you scale your idea or product across various networks with different operating systems, both regionally and globally? Broad question, but a good one. It's a good one, but we need another hour to do this one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a perfect tee up for the next webinar. <laughs> uh, uh, quickly and uh, quickly, and uh, I think, uh, like I said, uh, my first advice is figure out what's your business objective. Figure out what is your use case. That always dictates what technology you're going to adopt, what network you're going to choose. So and the se second one is you got to an analyze economics. I realized from the first poll that uh, 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 overwhelmingly, you know, uh, fifty percent are saying that uh, justify the business case is a major challenge. So uh, in any organization, if you are a change maker, if you are a transformational leader, you got to think about how to deliver value of, uh, in the shortest amount of time to get uh, executive attention, support, and organizational synergy to make this work. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be killed uh, in, in the inf <laughs> infancy. Okay, are we done? Or, or, or the slides going Fair backward enough. now? I, I, I think we have to wrap it there. That's a great shame because there are more questions coming all the time. And as you saw, they are really good. And uh, you guys have been very sporting, taking all questions from all comers. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. I'm afraid, as I say, we are out of time. There's nothing. We can't beat the clock. To everyone watching, please don't forget to bookmark our site at iot-now.com. And there you'll find the latest news, blogs, and interviews. And most importantly, from tomorrow, you can stream this webinar at the site too. It will also become available uh, at AV Systems w website as well. So it just remains for me to say a big thank you to our speakers, Will Yan. Many thanks for your time and your expertise, Will. Well, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Jeremy. I think we had fun. And I uh, look forward to do this uh, next time. Uh, of a uh, topic of your choice. It's been great. Let's do it again. And my thanks also to you, Mashin. Uh, it's been really great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, audience, for, for your time. Thanks for the great questions. Thanks for yeah. thanks to so follow up with us is avsystem.com. Avsystem, no S, avsystem.com. We'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you. Most of all, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you for joining us around the world with AV System. And from here, from everyone at IoT, bye for now. Bye-bye.